Welcome to Gutter Room. This is Will Sanchez. My special guest tonight is Betty Clark. She is the president of the Van Cortland Trek Club. I first met Betty during the last Memorial Day weekend. We were both participants for the 450 for the Fallen relay. Betty was part of the Bronx contingent. I was in Manhattan with my team waiting for them. They were going to bring the U.S. flag that eventually would make it to the Arlington National Park. It was a very emotional meeting. We hugged. Actually, Betty hugged everybody on sight. <laughs> Betty really knows how to work a crowd. I'm thrilled to have Betty Clark on the show. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Betty, let's get started by introducing yourself to our audience. For example, where were you born? And tell us a little bit about your childhood. I grew up in Montreal, an only child. Uh, spent a lot of time skiing and skating as a kid. Uh, never got into anything athletic, but uh, loved being very active. And I grew up kind of uh, with a father who traveled a lot, so was always very interested in things in other countries and uh, experiences around the world and got to travel a little bit with him. I was very lucky. Cool. Now, do you speak two languages then? I think Canadian has two official languages. In Quebec, yes. French is actually the official language in Quebec now. When I was growing up, um, it was a bilingual uh, province, uh, but you could still get away with just being a monolingual English speaker, which I was for most of my childhood. I went to English schools, uh -huh. but I did learn French. Um, I'm not fluent. I'd like to be, but I did learn French. You went into college. Did you do any sports there? Not really. I took like a relaxation class. I really wasn't that interested in sports. Um, it wasn't until I got to graduate school and I had a roommate who was a runner. Uh -huh. And he said, why don't you come run with me? I was choking and gasping and I thought this was not fun at all. This was in the States. I actually left to go to college um, to the States and then I went to graduate school in California. Okay. And so I was living in the hills near Stanford. I realized what terrible shape I was in and I thought I better do something about this. I was around people much older than me and fitter than me and I thought I've got to I've got to try. All right. What were you studying in college, by the way? I was an anthropology major, and that's partly, the, I think, the influence of growing up with someone who traveled all around the world. Um, and I was really interested in studying cultures in different places. Uh -huh. And so I went on to graduate school, um, and I did field work with the Australian Aborigines in the middle of the Australian outback. Um, oh, my gosh. That's a long way from home. A long way from home. Yeah. Wow. You, well, that has, must be very physically demanding. Yeah, and I think that's actually, that experience made me realize how much I like that kind of challenge, not just the cultural challenge, but the physical challenge. Everything you did required physical work, getting water, making food, you know, getting fire. I found it very satisfying. Uh -huh. Came back to the States. I was not sure what I wanted to do with my life. I decided to retrain in psychology, which is what I do now. Um, and I was living in New York. I saw some people running around the park. And I thought, oh, that looks like fun. And I just jumped into a race one day. And I realized that was fun. Uh -huh. I wasn't really trained. Um, but I thought maybe I'll take that more seriously at some point. But it really was not nothing I did regularly. Okay. I did run um, in as to raise money for Race for the Cure every year. I did that in memory and honor of my mother who had died of breast cancer. And so I kind of did that more as just a sort of fundraising effort. It wasn't really okay. to race, but it yeah. was a race. So Right, right. Right, to honor your mom. Did, honor did your mom die young? She did. She was only 35 and I was four, so I was really raised by my father. Oh, so yeah. sad. I've known what a bad disease okay. cancer is and uh, had always sort of had my eye on ways I might be able to help in some ways okay. as I got older. Well, now you're the president of Grand Cortland Track Club. So how did you dis discover them or did they discover you? Fast forward a whole lot. And um, I was living in Yonkers. Um, this is many years after I moved to New York, married with two children. And uh, the children were getting a little bit older and I had a little more time to myself. And I thought I got to get back in shape. Well, 
get in shape. I don't think I ever was in shape. <laughs> um, and I s used to drive back and forth from um, near Van Cortlandt Park, and I thought that looks like a very nice place. I had been living near Central Park. I knew about Central Park, but now living in Yonkers, I didn't know much about the parks around there. And so uh, I went online and found out there was a running club in Van Cortlandt. I guess what I saw was that these trails were there, and I didn't really want to try them by myself. So I thought, you know, maybe it would be great to connect with people who know them. So uh, I got an email right back after I emailed uh, Coach Ken, who is still part of our club. And I said, I'm a brand new runner. Can I join you one day? And he said, absolutely. I started running with the group and I just sort of fell in love both with the group and with the trails and with the whole thing. And the very first time I ran with them, I, um, I just found people that I could kind of keep up with uh -huh. and uh, started running on some of the trails and I suddenly realized I better ask them how far they were going and they said, oh, maybe about 10 miles and I gasped because I'd never run maybe more than three or four. How long ago was that? That was 10 years ago. Oh. Yeah, that's so, when I discovered them. So your running is relatively new. It's relatively new. Okay. I mean, the, our club is filled with people who've been running through high school and uh, I didn't even put on a pair of running shoes until you know, really graduate school. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And then I really didn't do it much for 10, 15 years after that. Wow, so Van Cortland got you started with 10 milers almost off the bat. And I realized how much I liked it, you know. Um, I found it hard. I liked it. I had never thought about racing competitively or anything, but you're with a group like that and there are people training for marathons and it had never even crossed my mind that would be anything I'd ever want to do. Okay. Um, but I trained for my first half marathon. It was Yonkers, very hilly course. Oh my God, that's a tough course, yes. Yeah. Um, but it's your hometown. It's my hometown. And, uh, and I loved it and I won my age group and I had never won anything athletic in my life. Excellent. So that kind of inspired me and made me realize it wasn't too late to get back into shape and keep running and um, and what I love about our club is there are many people who come to running late. I mean we have people who are very very um, established almost elite level runners but then we have people who discover it quite late and they can get better and better and just make it part of their lives in a wonderful way so. Uh, absolutely excellent but but now you're president. How did that happen? <laughs> well, that's a kind of funny story. I never had run competitively. I never thought of myself as a runner. I also never thought of myself as a group person. I'd never been, I think, you know, I'd never been part of any kind of organized group. When I joined the club, the club was actually um, kind of dwindling as a club and a kind of aging group of runners, um, not particularly competitively involved at that time. Um, and maybe because of the demography, I have no idea, but it was a rather rather small club at that time. And the the president, then president, Dennis, um, Dennis, who actually has very been very involved with the Friends of Van Cortland many other ways, uh, you know, he was trying to get more of us involved, and he asked me to come and help out sometimes at some of the meetings, and I did, and I started taking notes. And then somehow, when it was time for a board election and all of that, he said, how about running for the board? How about, and I thought that was kind of crazy, but I said, okay. Or perhaps you're training as a scholar, you knew how to organize these people. I don't know, you know, I don't know if I really knew what I was doing. <laughs> I just know that I was very enthusiastic. Um, I know that all these things, you know, they talk about perfect storms. This is like a perfect, I don't know what you call it, a good time, uh -huh. the opposite. I think with people moving up to the Bronx, I think with younger people joining the club, I think with um, just new people getting involved, the word spread. Um, and we've just grown tremendously. We're now like 400 members. So two years into your Van Cortlandt, you were elected president. How right. does that, is that an election or? A, yeah. or well, now, a, we, we, now we have, you know, a little more careful about the way we follow our bylaws. <laughs> <laughs> At that point, we couldn't get anybody to get involved. So we were kind of recruiting people always to okay. sort of take over. Now you, you need to be a member of the club, I think for at least a year before you get on one of our committees, and then you have to be a committee member for a year before you get on the board. Okay. Uh, at that time, it was actually two years, I mean, after I became president, we, we recognized we needed to try to encourage more and more people. Okay. So that's the way it is now. And we have found that it takes a while for people to get to know the club and know what the issues are and get to know each other, that it's good to give people a little bit of time. But usually, you know, a handful do all the work when you started. That's, until you... Yeah, I mean, I have to say that doesn't change a lot over the time. <laughs> 
I mean, we have more and more people stepping up, which is yeah. wonderful. We yeah, had well, you a, said you have all these committees. We have committees. We had some new members step up to be like race directors, which has been great. Um, but it is true that even with a lot of people, there still seem to be a core of really active people. I think the management studies have always said, you know, that uh, it's 20 percent of the people do 80 percent of the work. That's a sort of a corollary. I think that's right. And it's a labor of love, and everybody has a lot of work, and it, this is not a job for most people. Um, and I think part of why you get sometimes, uh, you don't get as many of the younger people involved is because some of them are raising young families. I mean, yes, it's yes. just harder for people yes, to have yes. the time. Yes. Well, what is your great satisfaction for being, you've been president now for over, over this 10 is years? my eighth year. Eighth yeah. year. Yeah. Um, it's just so wonderful to watch the club grow and thrive, to see people discover the joy of running to fall in love with Van Cortlandt Park, to become new competitors, people who never imagined doing that, actually enjoying getting out there and putting on a bib and running mm -hmm. for the team, um, which is a wonderful feeling. Mm -hmm. um, and I think just making running a part of your life, it's, you know, for many, many people, it has, there are many, many motivations. And uh, for many of us, it's not just about running. Yeah. There's the social part, it's, there's a therapeutic part. Yes, yes. Um, and it makes us all much stronger people, I think, yes, in many yes. ways. And yes. Well, let's go back um, because you have a, 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 a compelling personal story. Uh, if I recall, you ran New York City and, and you did very well. I think you could qualify for Boston. Right. Well, tell, us, tell us about that race and, and the aftermath. Right, so that was 2005, and I was training for my first marathon. I made a lot of the mistakes that a lot of first marathoners make. Uh, you know, I really did hit the wall. Actually, what, what's wonderful about Van Cortlandt Track Club was we set up a table between mile 20 and 21, just as you're leaving the Bronx to go back into Manhattan, and there's a huge cheering crowd, and no matter how bad you feel when you're coming up to that point, you put on a smile for the table and they get you through, which is how I felt in that race. Um, and I was pretty happy. I mean, I just made four hours, which at that age, because I wasn't a young runner, um, that was a qualifying time for me for Boston. That's so I was, I was very happy. But I had a little bit of a, a setback two months after running the marathon. So in January 2006, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. And it turned out to be a pretty um, aggressive and more advanced one than I would have liked, uh, even though I'd been very careful because of my family history right, to right. always have to be checked. And my particular kind of tumor didn't show up on a mammogram. And uh, anyway, I had to start pretty intensive treatment at that time wow. and in fact in January when we had our awards uh, dinner and that's when actually I was asked if I would take on the presidency I was like I don't know you know I have to start this whole thing right but um, like with anything else like preparing for a marathon you really can only do one thing at a time and you just sort of you can't sort of imagine the whole future yes you have goals but you just take it one step at a time so I thought okay you know I'll try it I actually um, saw lots of different doctors and I remember choosing the ones that had a more positive outlook like I wanted to have a positive outlook and I remember saying you know I just qualified for the Boston Marathon. I mean, this should have been the last thing on my mind. Do you think there's any chance I could run in April? And most of them thought I was totally crazy. Right. But I had a few, like a surgeon who said, well, you know, you may be take, you may be in chemotherapy then. I wasn't sure about the extent of my treatment. So not sure, but there's no reason to think that might not be possible. Okay. So I kind of liked that attitude. Okay. But it turned out I really was in the middle of chemotherapy um, that spring, and so I had to defer, which I did. In those days, you could defer for a year. Um, I kept running. And really, my club, I mean, I have to say that what the most memorable thing about being part of our club is that we are there to support each other whenever we need each other. And um, there were many days I didn't feel like getting out of bed or walking to the end of the block. Um, and people came and picked me up and made me get out there and walk on the trails even when I wasn't running. Um, so I kept active. Um, I ran a little bit but didn't race too much. But I actually, you know, met all kinds of new people at the time I was going through my treatment. When my hair started to come back and I started to run more, um, I'd meet people in the park and tell them my story and they would come run and just sort of went on from there. So I did manage to train for Boston that next year, 2007. And I was, you know, just, you know, not really that strong. But I decided to do it as a fundraiser for Gilda's Club that year. 
I'm Gilda Radner. And, uh, <laughs> okay, now. <laughs> Gilda once said that having cancer gave her membership in an elite club she'd rather not belong to. Gilda's Club is a wonderful organization and I always loved Gilda Radner and her whole approach to life. Um, and I decided since they depend entirely on private donations, I would, and, and I didn't want the pressure of having to raise a huge amount of money because I didn't know if I'd actually be able to finish. So I thought I'll just see what I can do. And um, I just tried to recruit a little bit here and there. And I was running really for the people I was in a support group with too, some of whom were not doing very well. Yeah. Uh, so I thought of it as an opportunity just to see if I could get through and take one mile at a time. And what I had discovered in my treatment um, was that, you know, just like you have to get through every mile in a marathon, getting through every treatment is very similar. It's kind of like, all right, I'm almost halfway through. That means I can get through the next half, okay. which I don't know. In a race, I often feel that way. Yes, you know, if yes, I can get course. to the halfway point. Uh, 10K to go. Whatever, exactly, whatever exactly. You, do, yeah. you know, you get through the half marathon mark, okay, you know, then you just count down the... So I think that kind of mentality helps a lot with anything in life, mm -hmm. and that helped me a lot in my treatment, too. And uh, one of my good friends in the club, who was the one I walked with a lot, had run for a team in training in a marathon. And he told me he'd seen uh, a shirt that said something like, if you think running 26.2 miles is hard, try, uh, try chemotherapy. And he talked to me about that. And I said, you know, I'm not so sure. Chemotherapy is bad, but running 26.2 miles is hard, too. So it's all relative, okay. you know. And um, each one of them requires getting through each step. That's really okay. what it is. If I recall reading your story about the Boston, you, you thought about the people at Gilda's Club, yeah. you know, either they had passed on or they were struggling to help you motivate you. I thought that was very moving. It really did. And, you know, even those miles that were really tough, um, you know, that kind of kept me going and I started to cry when I crossed the finish line. When so, I got to Gilda's Club a, a few days later, yes. you know, they all clapped uh, for me. Oh, cool. Right. Yes, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. You were the winner. <laughs> Through that, you were a winner. Yeah. Oh, so, so your cancer went to remission at some point? You never know, right? I mean, I'm, I'm very hopeful. Uh, they used to say if you were five years post-treatment, uh -huh. you were cured. But they don't say that about breast cancer anymore because there are lots of recurrences. And I now work um, talking to newly diagnosed patients and patients in treatment at the American Cancer Society. And, um, you know, people do have to deal with recurrences yes, quite often. Yes, that's interesting. So, you know, it's constant monitoring, but it's also hopefulness. And okay. I have to say... Physically, I feel stronger than I've ever felt, and I'm running better than I've ever run, so I just have to be hopeful. Now, for the American Cancer Society, is that a volunteer work, or is that part of your no, practice? No, I, I am a psychologist, and I have a clinical practice. Um, but after my treatment and whole experience, I wanted to find a way to work more with people going through treatment and uh, to find more ways of supporting them. So I actually approached uh, the Riverdale Y because um, I know the fitness director there. Actually, I met her running through Van Cortland Park. And we had this idea of putting together a program to help people who had chronic illnesses, uh, not just cancer, but anything else. Um, and she loved the idea of me doing a support group, and we were going to try to do some physical like have people encourage people to go to uh, yoga classes, swimming classes, fitness classes of all kinds. And through that, I contacted the American Cancer Society because I knew there weren't that many resources in the Bronx. So uh, I went and talked to them and talked to some of their support groups. And then uh, they had a grant to um, place uh, people in hospitals, in public hospitals all over New York City, two hospitals in the Bronx, Lincoln and Jacoby, uh, to help help newly diagnosed patients find the resources that would help them outside of the medical resources, mm -hmm. social, emotional support, mm -hmm. uh, fitness programs, things like that. And so this is actually a grant funded project. Um, and my job was to recruit and train volunteers to go into the hospitals and also to do the work myself. So I basically go in and uh, talk to people who are either newly diagnosed or newly in treatment. And uh, it's kind of, it's, it's not exactly like traditional therapy at all. It's mm -hmm. sort of like um, just general support. Uh, we don't expect our volunteers to be trained therapists. Right, right. Um, but it's also offering very concrete help like 
a wig. Um, there's a wonderful program called Look Good, Feel Better, all kinds of programs like that that mm -hmm. they can get mm -hmm. free of charge. Um, and very often these are families without many resources, so it's a very satisfying work. Right, so like Gilda's Club and all the things rolled in that your Ex personal exactly. interpretation of it. Exactly, and I actually do refer people to Gilda's Club too, if they live somewhere nearby. Or yeah, yes, yes, I, because I know they're in the Bronx now. They, they have a satellite, exactly. You re recently were honored as the Friend of the Month by the Friends of Air Cortland Park. But tell us what's the honor about. And by the way, congratulations. Well, thank you. Basically, we, we are trying to bring attention to the park in many ways, both to runners um, and to the general public who can't believe when they finally get there what a jewel this is in the Bronx. Um, runners come up for New York Road Runner cross-country races and they've lived in the New York area all their lives and have never seen this park. So we're delighted to introduce this park to people but also to kind of point out the need for support for the park. Um, so we've also started to put on some races to raise funds for the maintenance of the trails. Um, we really want to increase awareness. Uh, every time we have a new runner join us they, they get to run on the trails. It's really an amazingly wonderful privilege actually uh, to have this park and so uh, we've done as much as we can we can do more but we want to do as much as we can mm -hmm. to sort of raise awareness and and actual funds to, to do the maintenance on the trails. In fact you recently had a race a 5k I believe? It was a 5k and a 10k on Labor Day uh, and we hope to do that you know, on an annual basis. Uh, there are two more races in the series called, uh, it's called Run for the Trail. Um, one is coming up in October, October the 26th, Sunday the 26th. Um, and then, which is a Halloween race, we're gonna have a costume contest too, and hopefully some kids activities. And then uh, in November, an alumni race, it's on the Friday of Thanksgiving weekend. Uh, and that's to bring back people who have a history in the park. There are a lot of people who, for whom Van Cortlandt Park was very important in their high school running years, in their college running years, um, and uh, it's wonderful to have, invite them back and do a kind of fun run in the park. We actually don't put on those races. BronxNet is doing one and the Conservancy is doing another, but we're there kind of sp supporting it and helping. Right, right. We probably supply a, a race captain or a race director or something. Right, and well, we do the marshalling because we know the trail so well and we know how to position people in the corner. Right, right. In fact, I think I saw a video of Bobby Asher was the most recent, and he was very enthusiastic and supportive. Yes. And, he, and I remember, uh, I think he's, he helps in the kids program. So you have a he kids does. component. New York Roadrunners has all these wonderful youth programs. We want to be able to sponsor um, a school in the Bronx, um, and some of us are volunteering for the youth programs in the park. They have all kinds of uh, great programs now, Mighty Milers, a buddy program, um, and it's really important in the Bronx to be encouraging this kind of activity yes, for kids. Yes, yes. So uh, we want to get more involved with that too. Yes, yes. Does it, does it really make a big difference in the amount of money that's raised to help to maintain the trails? You know, I. I don't know because uh, the funding for the trails, um, I mean there are different pots of money and different organizations involved. Mm -hmm. I know the Friends um, puts together programs, especially for high schoolers, um, to encourage them to come out and work on the trails and learn about the nature and the funds that we raise help to support those programs, oh, okay. which is really nice okay. because they actually maintain the trails as well. So it's a little, it's indirect, okay. but I think it's very important because it's involving okay. kids and making them aware of the importance oh, okay. of looking after the park. Okay. Well, as you know, I'm familiar with the Putnam Trail much more than the other trails. The Putnam now, Trail, yeah. When, when you say maintain the trails, are we talking about the cross-country trail? Not Talking about the cross-country trail and some of the nature trails as well, because okay. I um, so John Kiernan and, and and John Muir. Muir. What right. about the Putnam Trail? Um, we would like funding to go into maintaining that trail. Um, improving it in the sense of removing the tire ties yes, that yes, are there, yes, yes. Uh, making it more passable for everybody, yes, yes. Um, but not necessarily paving it. Okay. Um, I know there's been a lot of controversy around that and money that was earmarked for it. Um, there, Not everyone agrees in one way of doing right, things. Right, right. And so, right, you know, right. uh, it, it's hard to get a whole, a whole club and everybody to sort of be unified on this. Yeah. But, you speak to most runners and they would much prefer to keep the, the trail.
possible. As natural as possible. You know, not only for the environmental reasons, which of course are great, right, the wetlands right. and the, the flora and fauna that grow around it, um, but the sheer beauty and the pleasure of being able to run on unpaved surfaces, which are so few and far between yes, in New York City. Yes, yes. Um, and when you arrive on this small one mile, one and a quarter mile area, when you've been on either the Westchester side or the other side that's paved, um, you're, you're entering a new world. You just feel like you could be anywhere. Um, and we've managed to share with the cyclists and other people. I mean, I know they can't go as fast as they'd like, and it's muddy and mucky, yes, but that's yes. what trails are like. That's you know? right. Oh, I think it's a beautiful trail. When I got on the Putnam Trail, I said, wow, as you said, it was an oasis. I said, I couldn't believe this trail. Right. I had a bad knee, but I was able to run pain-free on that trail. Yeah. And also just, you know, there's just something sort of very peaceful and quiet when you get onto that softer surface. Uh, and today, you know, I, I had a sort of stressful morning and I, I live in Yonkers really over a footbridge into Tibbetts Park, which is part of the Putnam Trail that is paved, but I can get into the Bronx on that same path and enter onto that unpaved portion, and suddenly it's like uh, you're, you, you know, you feel the sort of stress level go down, you're hearing the birds more, uh, you, you're just somehow much more at one with nature, so. Yes, yes, well, hopefully everybody will come together and compromise, and uh, and maybe t next year we'll be sitting down and saying, wow, is the Putnam Trail beautiful, and we're going to have a race to help support and maintain it because that's one of the issues as well is the ongoing maintenance. Right. That's well I know the issue of stone dust and, and um, but I also know having spent a lot of time hiking and running in places like Acadia National Park there's no pavement anywhere in those parks and they're all accessible to everybody so. Well, that's great. Yeah. But in closing what are some of your future challenges? You got a race coming up? I do actually I'm running the Montreal Marathon uh, at the end of this month and uh, it is my hometown, but I've never run a marathon there, so I'm kind of excited to do that and have a few family members I hope will come out and watch. And I'll be at the New York City Marathon. I am signed up to run. I, I always am a little ambivalent about whether I want to do two so close together, but I'll probably be there. At least I'll either be at mile 20 supporting everybody or I'll be on, on the course. Betty, thank you so much for coming in. This has been a great pleasure. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much.